Hello, my name is Nathan Brummel. Today I want to talk to you about the end of the life of Theodore Beza. And here in part five, we look at how he becomes Calvin's successor in Geneva. So Calvin died at a rather young age, and Beza is the man whom Calvin had identified as his successor. All the other pastors in Geneva, too, recognized the splendid gifts that the Lord had given to Theodore Beza. And so Beza succeeded John Calvin as the first among equals. Yes, I know, people have claimed that John Calvin was the Pope of Geneva. He never was a Pope, and he certainly never was any type of theological or biblical dictator. The magistrates, remember, ran the city in many respects. Calvin, however, was the leading preacher, the leading theologian in the city. He was also the chairman of their pastors, which was called the Venerable Company of Pastors. So Beza, when he arrived in Geneva, found a Calvin who was only 54 years old, and yet a Calvin who felt much older than that. Calvin had struggled with so many different sicknesses and challenges that it's kind of depressing to read about all of the sicknesses that he had. Calvin was only 10 years older than Beza, and uh, yet Beza had sort of viewed Calvin as a spiritual father. Calvin, of course, had such intense spirituality, such a profound biblical and theological understanding that he was a wonderful mentor to the younger Beza. The two men did share intense admiration for each other. Beza recognized the wonderful endowments of Calvin and his love for the glory of God. And Beza was given too, also by God, such great gifts. But what is striking is that they loved each other. You know, what does it matter if we know all doctrine or we're great biblical scholars and we lack love? Well, then we're like a clanging symbol. Calvin and Beza loved each other. Calvin saw in Beza not a slavish copy of himself like a mini Calvin or something like that. No, he saw a scholar who he thought had greater polish and wider knowledge of polite society than him. He felt that Beza was someone who was prepared to deal with things that he couldn't. Um, he saw that Beza had wide-ranging uh, abilities in the scriptures as a poet, as a theologian. In fact, at one point... Calvin heard about Beza being sick. And Calvin wrote a letter in which he expresses how he just beside himself with worthy worry. He said, I should not be a man if I did not love him who loves me with more than a brother's love and honors me as a father. And so when Calvin passed away, Beza stepped into this vacuum of leadership and he became chairman of the company of the pastors. <clears throat> Now, this didn't mean that he was a dictator. <clears throat> In fact, I've found that as a chairman of the consistory, it's simply a position where you serve the welfare of the church. And as a chairman of a consistory, I never viewed it as a position of great power or something like that. In fact, as a chairman, I never had even the right to vote unless there was a tie to break or something like that. But um, it was the same thing in Geneva. Calvin before Beza and Beza himself did not run Geneva like they were popes. They had multiple pastors who together would get together and decide on issues dealing with the spiritual welfare of the city. In fact, each year the, the venerable company would take some time to even censure the chairman if he had done anything wrong. So notice how there was accountability. You don't hear this with popes. Popes don't get together with their bishops and allow their bishops to censure their actions in the previous year. Beza here, knowing his own fallibility and also the weakness of every one of Christ's pastors, was willing to submit to century. He was open to redirection and accountability, which is a good sign for an office bearer of Jesus Christ. Yes, he was the first among equals, but that was due to his gifts, and his leadership. Calvin and Beza were not men who abused their authority. They did not lord it over other pastors. 
In fact, they were very, very sacrificial in that they needed to work with other pastors in the church who had significant weaknesses. In fact, Beza supported the fact that in 1580, they began to revolve the chairmanship. It's not like he's someone who wanted to cling to power. At that point, they began to have a different pastor preside over the pastoral meetings each week so that the burden of being a chair could be shared. Now, in Geneva, Beza, as he took over from Calvin, he, of course, was a preacher. We tend to think about John Calvin as some theologian who's just writing commentaries or a biblical scholar writing commentaries as a theologian who's constantly developing his institutes. But if you had actually lived in Geneva, you would have experienced John Calvin as your preacher and your pastor. And that's what Theodore Beza was. He was the preacher and pastor in Geneva. And so he carried out the duties of a pastor, preaching, preaching often. But in addition to that, he retained his professorship and he also engaged in scholarship, biblical scholarship. In 1565, a year after Calvin's death, he published what was his most important contribution to biblical studies. That was an edition of the Greek New Testament along with the Latin Vulgate and an original translation of the Latin by himself. During his years in Geneva, Calvin engaged in some very important work in biblical studies. One thing he did is he put together a Greek text of the New Testament that he published. He also was involved in translating the Bible out of the Greek into the Latin so that the Orthodox Reformed would have a fresh Latin translation. And also, very importantly, he continued to work on the French translation of the Bible, editing and tweaking that for the rest of his life. So Beza made some very important contributions in biblical studies. He uh, published his own translation of the New Testament into Latin, and he also put together a Greek text. Now Beza used in putting together this Greek text a very valuable manuscript that was of great antiquity. The Wars of Religion in France in God's providence, led this important Greek text into his hand that helped him to put together his Greek New Testament. This was an unseal. Now, an unseal is a Greek text. We often refer to Greek texts of the Bible as unseals, where they have all uppercase letters and no punctuation. And all the letters just run together. Can you imagine trying to read things like that in English? If all you wrote in was capital letters... And they're all connected to each other, right next to each other, no spaces, and there is no punctuation. Well, that's how the Greeks originally wrote. What we call minuscules are later Greek uh, manuscripts that now begin to write with also lowercase letters and also involve punctuation. Now, the unseal that came into Beza's hands is now known to the world as Codex Bezae or Bizai, and it is referred to by the letter D, if you look inside of your Greek New Testament, and you have alternate readings. This unseal apparently had long rested in the library of the Monastery of St. Irenaeus at Lyons in France. It was a copy of the New Testament made in the middle of the 6th century, so it goes back to the 500s, and it included the Gospel accounts and the Acts of the Apostles, both in Greek and in Latin. Now, when the wars of religion broke out in France, Huguenot soldiers were able to get their hands on this precious monument of antiquity and happily was saved and somehow ended up in the possession of Beza. Now, as a Greek scholar, Beza recognized its value, although he tells us that he was started by, by the originality of some of the readings in this unseal, because some of the readings were different from other manuscripts in the majority tradition that were available in Europe. Beza later surprisingly donated this manuscript of the Greek New Testament to the University of Cambridge. It's now their most precious manuscript. That's why there's a large portrait of Theodore Beza outside the office of the head librarian 
at the University of Cambridge Library today. So Beza was able to use a Greek New Testament manuscript that dated from the middle of the 6th century. In his work on a Greek New Testament, he was also able to use a manuscript from the latter part of the 6th century that was called the Codex Claremontanus because Beza found it in Claremont. This manuscript had the latter part of the New Testament. This was later in the possession of the National Library of Paris. But Beza was chiefly indebted to the previous edition of the Greek New Testament of Robert Stephens, 1550. This was the fourth or fifth edition of Erasmus's Textus Receptus. The result of Beza's labors in comparing different Greek manuscripts was a new edition of the text of the New Testament that appeared in 1582 and that has had a great influence in the history of biblical studies. So Beza's Greek New Testament had a big influence and then his Latin Bible, his translation of the New Testament into Latin had a separate influence. It was published over a hundred times. It was sort of like the King James Bible of international Calvinism in the 17th and 18th centuries. It had a better sense of the Bible than the Latin Vulgate did. Beza's Latin translation shows the gifts of a linguistic scholar who is familiar with both Greek and Latin. What a perfect translator he was. Now, Beza today isn't known as much for his biblical scholarship, and that's part of this caricature of him as some type of dry, scholastic, dogmatic theologian. But Beza is probably viewed in such a negative light because of his controversial writings. He was someone who wasn't afraid, like Calvin, to defend the doctrines of grace against Eris, and also to defend the Reformed faith against whether Lutherans on one side or Roman Catholics on another. He developed theology in line with John Calvin's thought and the wider consensus among Reformed Protestants. He wrote a summary of Christian doctrine. He engaged in polemics. He wrote on everything from predestination to the Lord's Supper, which were the big issues in his day. He was involved in a debate with the Lutheran attack dog, Andrea. After a debate, for example, Andrea would not shake Beza's hand as a fellow Christian. Here he was a genuine Lutheran, he thought, following in Luther's footsteps who hadn't been brotherly towards Ulrich Zwingli. The Reformed had always shown more brotherly love towards the Lutheran believers than the Lutherans showed back to the Reformed. Beza also wrote a short biography of John Calvin's life, and Beza's Life of Calvin has had a long influence and is in print to this very day. The life of Calvin, says Baird, breathes in every line the deep affection and unbounded reverence in which his biographer holds him. It is no blind panegyric, but a eulogy based on firm conviction. In this book, Beza writes, It can be affirmed, and all those that have known him will be good and sufficient witnesses to the truth of this, that never has Calvin had an enemy who, in assailing him, has not waged war against God. He writes that God gave Calvin grace so that he never yielded in the Lord's quarrels. He said this about Calvin's God-centered teachings, those who shall read his writings and shall seek the glory of God in uprightness will there behold the shining of the majesty whereof I speak. Beza apparently also wrote a three-volume work that was published at Antwerp in 1580, although published anonymously, on the history of the Reformed churches in France. This work is entitled in English, The Ecclesiastical History of the Reformed Churches in the Kingdom of France. Our humanistic reformer also used his poetic gifts to prepare metrical psalms in French. He played a very strong role in the development of the Huguenot Psalter. Oh, the French Reformed loved to sing the Psalms. Yes, I know that the Scottish Presbyterians love to sing the Psalms. Yes, the Dutch Reformed have loved to sing the Psalms. But I think the French Reformed, above all, love to sing the Psalms. Yes, the Swiss love to sing the Reformed, the Psalms as well. 
but maybe it was the plight of the French Reformed and the constant danger that they were in and the terrible persecution unleashed against them that made them especially appreciative of the Psalms. Beza as a poet and as a profound biblical scholar and interpreter could enter easily into the devotional spirit of David's Psalms and the Psalms of Asaph. The best song in the Psalter of the French Reformed is Beza's rendition of Psalm 68. The initial stanza of 12 lines deserves more than any other passage to be regarded as the choicest jewel of all of these songs. It was the Huguenot, it became the Huguenot battle song. A poet named Moreau did translate some of the Psalms and made them into metrical songs, but Beza by 1562 had completed the entire Psalter. Up until that time, the church, remember the Roman Catholic Church, had proscribed, not allowed the singing of songs and the singing of, of congregational singing in church. In fact, when churches began to have members breaking out into a cappella singing of the psalms, that was a sure sign to a Roman Catholic that heresy had invaded their cathedral. The 13th National Synod of the French Reformed Churches that met at Montauban in 1594 asked Beza to translate into French rhyme the hymns of the Bible so that they could be sung in church with the psalms. Beza complied, but the 16 hymns that appeared in 1595 quickly fell into disuse. The French Reform simply preferred to sing the psalms. They didn't even want to sing hymns found elsewhere in the Bible. The later years of Beza in Geneva were years of great influence. Back in May of 1550, two years after Beza fled France, he was summoned to appear in court in France. The parliament in Paris summoned him. And they did that because they wanted to do a heresy trial. When he didn't show up, they condemned him in his absence and claimed that all of his property now belonged to the king. And in August 1 of 1564, there was an edict of pacification when for a little while the French reform got, I mean the French Roman Catholic government was being a little easier on the reformed and they annulled that. Perhaps uh, family members back in France who remained Roman Catholic supported uh, Beza because we know that he had enough money that he was able to live on this money without a salary at all from the academy at times or a small salary. So what must have happened is some of his relatives in France who remained Roman Catholic so respected their nephew and relative that they gave him money in his will. Now he and his wife never had children and they really took advantage of this of the fact that they did not have the responsibility of caring for children and they often took guests into their home. Both he and his wife were very social and they loved to have the company of young people. In 1588, after 44 years of marriage, Beza's wife died of the plague. This was the Claudine de Snaz, whom he had secretly married three or four years before fleeing France. Now, although their union was childless and God in his sovereignty did not decide to give them children, they had lived together in great happiness. Claudine was a faithful and loving wife, and Beza was a godly husband. Beza celebrated her virtues in poetry. He did marry a second wife, Genevieve Del Piano, the widow of a Genovese refugee, when he was 70 years old. He wanted a companion in his loneliness. And he had a blessed second marriage, of course, uh, without children. God gave Bays a good health and a long life, and he continued to serve the Lord faithfully to an age when many men might have retired a number of times. He was busy into his 70s and 80s. In fact, at age 75 in 1594, he wrote to Melanchthon's son-in-law, Gaspard Putzer, what work he was involved in at the age of 75, which, remember, was much older back in those days. He wrote, 
With the exception of a trembling of the hand that almost prevents my trace in line, I am well enough, thank God, to preach every Sunday and to deliver every fortnight my three theological lectures. The auditorium is pretty well filled for these trying times. I am overwhelmed with occupations of different sorts, an infinite number, not those which depend on my office, and to which I am accustomed by virtue of it, but occupations that come every instant from without, difficulties that must absolutely be met and solved, of which you can easily imagine the multitude and importance in this whirlwind of war that drags us along. Thus it is that in the midst of agitations I struggle and am nearing the end of my course with my spirit as much as possible on high. Beza took the time to do the very important work of revising the French translation of the Bible that was used by the Protestants. This had been originally made, this translation, by Robert Robert Levitanus, Calvin's cousin. Calvin and others had labored to improve it, and Beza and his colleagues made this a labor of love as well. The lectures of Beza continued to be the best attended in the academy, even when he was older. Students in the different faculties, whether they came to study law or medicine, always attended Beza's theological or biblical lectures, no matter what part of the Bible he was teaching on. Beza lived all the way into the next century, and he passed away in 1605. On the last day of his life, he asked, Is the city in full safety and quiet? His friend said, Yes. Beza suddenly sank down, losing strength and consciousness at once, and in a few minutes passed peacefully away while souring friends prayed about his bedside, Baird tells us. And so ended the very long ministry of Beza. Now his works are wide-ranging. Many of them have not been translated from Latin into English. And then there are some that have been translated by men like Philip Holtrop at Calvin College, but that remain unpublished at this point. And I think that in the future, as more of his works are translated and made available to a wider public, the influence of Theodore Beza, the humanist successor of Calvin, will only continue to grow.